Coming up next is Mimi Nardi and her guidance on how to play when the score is tight. Leveraging her experience as a professional athlete, college professor, and business entrepreneur, she will be sharing how to apply sports psychology into whatever situation you are facing and be victorious. All right, uh, I'm so excited to be here. I just wanna say thank you so much to the side community uh, for having me. And I'm going to talk to you guys today about something that's really near and dear to my heart, sports psychology for business leadership. Specifically, I want to talk about how to play when the score is tight. So this is gonna be about a 35 minute presentation. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself, talk about sports as an epistemology, what do I mean by that? Really dig into the idea of how to play when the score is tight by looking at four psychologies of tight games. Tight games, I mean that literally in sporting events, but I also mean that more importantly in business and in life. And I want you to really reflect on where you are right now in your business and in your life. As far as my personal introduction, I know some of you may have already um, met my acquaintance or, or seen some of the videos that uh, I've done. I know that I heard a rumor that um, my Beyonce parody video was circulating on Slack. Uh, my husband is a real estate broker uh, with Society Real Estate and Development at Side. He made that transition earlier this year. and. Uh, so far, he's loving it. I'm loving it. I am married to real estate, so I am as excited, if not more excited, that he is, that he's getting the great, uh, you know, service and support through side. Uh, but my, you know, my uh, personal history is kind of an interesting one. My professional history is an interesting one. And I always want to preface it by giving my philosophy on career cycles to give context to what I've been doing uh, with myself over the past several years. And start off with a book recommendation. If you have ever read uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, you already know what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, I recommend that you take a look at this book. It's really fantastic. One of the key concepts that I really love in this book is the idea that uh, if you invest 10,000 hours into anything, you can become prodigious at that thing. So basically there is a clear, simple mathematical equation, 10,000 hours into something equals, you know, excellence or accomplishment on the back end of that. Um, and what I have seen is that 10,000 hours for me is about a 10 year cycle. I do notice that I'm becoming more and more efficient as I go through these cycles. But I, you know, the way I look at my my life and my experience, I want to commit to something for a certain time, really make sure that I reach, you know, what I feel like is a satisfactory level of accomplishment at that. And then I try to translate that experience into a new endeavor. So what has that looked like? My first career cycle, I actually started quite young and quite early uh, as a professional athlete. By the age of 14, I was on the US Olympic development uh, track here to play soccer. Uh, but when I was 15, the country of Ghana formed a women's national team. And my dad is originally from Ghana in West Africa. And I was able to leverage my dual citizenship to try out for the Ghanaian women's national soccer team. And I had a seven year tenure with the national team that culminated with me playing in the 2003 FIFA Women's World Cup. I also have a silver medal from the African Women's Cup of Nations uh, tournament in 2002. So if you are a sports enthusiast, a soccer enthusiast, women's soccer fan in, in particular, I do have a TEDx talk about that experience that you can check out, uh, just called African Women's Soccer and Empowerment, Memoirs of a Black Queen. After this very amazing experience that I had playing soccer that took me all around the world, I just threw myself and hurled myself into academia. And so the second career cycle that I engaged in was as a college professor. And I was very privileged to teach at some of the greatest un universities and institutions here in Southern California, at UCLA, at Occidental, at LMU. I taught classes in environmental science and public health. I've been able to, you know, uh, publish and speak on many different kinds of academic topics specifically related to health and the environment. But that cycle also kind of, you know, turned over and came to something of an end. And I have moved on into a space of social entrepreneurship. So now what I'm doing is taking all of the experiences that I've had before and leveraging them into opportunities to really make 
big social impact and social change. So I do speaking. I have an organization called Race, Class, and Parenting uh, that supports the dissemination of information to parents to kind of support them as they uh, parent from a stronger social justice perspective. And I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Narte Sports Foundation, which is the charitable giving arm of my husband's real estate business. So that's who I am in a nutshell when I'm not out there doing Beyonce videos. <laughs> but I wanna talk today about sports because sports is the foundational experience and it underlies the success that I've had and all of the different things that I have endeavored to do. Uh, athlete itself is a privileged identity that I've been able to leverage in many different circumstances, but the most important thing uh, for me about playing sports is that I have seen and come to understand that sports is its own epistemology. I'm really passionate about knowing how to know things, and I am an interdisciplinarian. So when I say epistemology, epistemology really means a way of knowing things. And I believe that there are many valid different ways to know things through science, through religion, through philosophy, ancestral knowledge, logical reasoning, sometimes even just intuition. But I think uh, you know it's worth bringing sports into the conversation as an epistemology, as a way of understanding the universal laws of nature uh, and universal sociological principles and universal business principles. So that's kind of what I want to get into today. And specifically, I want to talk about how to play when the score is tight. So leveraging sports and my sports experience, I want to talk about how you can play when the score is tight for you in your business and in your life. And why is it important to know how to play when the score is tight? It basically all boils down to this. Whenever you have an imbalanced competition where uh, one team is much, much better than the other, the outcome of that game is really just dependent on technical issues, not tactical choices. So it doesn't really provide as much insight into critical universal dynamics. And when you think about it, you yourself as a you know realtor, um, if you're going up, let's create a competition between you and another person who's going up for a particular business. If your professional uh, experience far outweighs the other person that you are competing for in that business, you can see that it's not really such a tactical issue. It's really just that you have you know, technically more skills and more experience that you have to leverage. But when there are well-matched competitions, the critical difference always comes down to strategy. It comes down to coaching. And in reality, life and business are full of tight scores of closely balanced competition. I'm going to argue that 2021 is a tight game. 2021 is a championship year already. Um, at, you know, we are down uh, already because we've conceded coronavirus, which has brought health risks, uh, you know, limited our freedom of movement. It's, you know, threatened livelihoods. It's created a cultural disruption. Just, you know, we have distance learning for people who are parents or grandparents or mentors to children. We see the impact of that on our lives. There's also been a lot of social and political unrest throughout 2020 that we are carrying into uh, 2021. So all of this has caused us to reevaluate our progress on the ideals we believe in as Americans. It's put strain on our relationships and on our vision for the future. But uh, a champion always overcomes greater obstacles than a winner. There's a difference between a winner and there's a difference between a champion. And it's going to take strategic thinking to have the outcomes that we really want for 2021. And we're going to have to leverage all of our previous wins to have the outcomes that we really want in 2021. We've had years before where we've been winners, where we've come out ahead. But this is going to be a championship year because it is a tight game. What's funny about looking at the way soccer games go is that often at halftime, if the score is 2-1, the final score is 3-2. This is something that happens very, very frequently, which is an interesting phenomenon that I just kind of picked up on over time as an athlete. Uh, usually we have four different scenarios that play out. You either are ahead 2-1 and you go on to win 3-2. You are ahead 2-1 and you end up losing 3-2 by the end of the game, you're losing 2-1 at half, and you go on and concede 3-2 by the end of the game, 
or you're losing two one at half and somehow you muster the fight to be, to win the game three two by the end it's just very interesting but these four scenarios um when you look at them and you really kind of take it apart dismantle it unpack it what you see is that if the score is two one at half it means the teams are closely matched there's evidence already that both teams have the capacity to score and there's evidence that both teams have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. And again, I just think this is such an important and powerful metaphor for our lives, for our businesses, because we are often in scenarios and arguably again this year in a scenario where we have seen that we have the capacity to overcome. We have the capacity to be great. We have the capacity to win. But we've also seen that we have vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that we had imagined and that we had never imagined prior to the moment that we're in right now. So we have to really be extremely strategic and specific in leveraging, you know, the experiences that we've had and great ideas to move us forward to towards the outcomes that we want. Fundamentally, it boils down to this. It's you it's your business versus, and you can just fill in the blank, fill in the blank right now. It could be uh, COVID, it could be, you know, vicissitudes in the market, it could be uh, economic changes and economic uncertainty. It's a tough match. And also what's fantastic about this information that I'm sharing with you is that it's so relevant now, but it's not your last tough match and it will be relevant again in the future. The important thing to remember is that if you are listening to this talk right now, you are still in the game. You know, there's this great uh, UFC fighter that always says, if you're able to tap out, it means you're able to recover also. So if you are still in it, if you're still listening right now, there's still time on the clock and there's still an opportunity to uh, turn this game around. But at the same time, there's still pot potential vulnerability to your production right now. So we still don't know exactly where we're going with COVID. We don't know where we're going with the economy. We don't know about, you know, seasonal shifts in the market. We don't know what's ahead. The eighth level of Jumanji, who knows what it's going to look like. So right now we just need to be poised and prepared, strategically thinking about how it is that we're going to overcome whatever comes our way so that we can finish strong. The question that you have to ask yourself is, where are you in your life and in your business right now? And this may seem like an obvious question, but honestly, so often people do not end up coming out ahead in tight scores or in tight games because they aren't able to accurately, correctly, critically evaluate where they really are. They are not aware if they are ahead or they're not aware if they're behind. So the questions that you need to ask yourself, if you are ahead, chances are you haven't really struggled to close business uh, or to generate new deals in the past several months to a year. We know that the real estate market has been, you know, surprisingly resilient and able to withstand all of these uncertainties. So you may say, you know, my business is going well at this point. Uh, you may have been able to achieve some sort of expansion of your brand through this time. That's been the case even for my own husband. He actually launched his business with Side in the midst of the pandemic. Um, you may be maintaining your well being. And you may have achieved a functional rhythm relatively quickly. So you may be situated in a position where you feel like you're ahead in this scenario right now. On the flip side, you might feel like you're behind in this scenario right now. You may be struggling to close the business that you have, struggling to win listings and buyers, struggling to find new business, or struggling to adapt in other areas of your personal life that are affecting your business in turn, because we know how closely linked all of these situations are. So I wanna break down the four psychologies of tight games. And I already kind of explained the scenarios to you where you're ahead and you're able to win, where you're ahead but you concede your lead, where you're behind and you lose versus being behind and being able to come back from behind to still win. So let's look at the first psychology. When you are ahead, what does it take to win the game because the game's not over. It's going to take discipline. 
It's going to take focus. It's going to take an understanding of the risks of complacency. Although you're ahead at this moment, it's not time to be complacent just because, of, again, of the uncertainty of our current circumstances. You need to understand how to strategically leverage even a small advantage, the small advantage that you may have right now. And you need to maintain a willingness to take positive risks. And finally, you're going to need a killer instinct. So you need to know that moment, uh, you know, when to move forward with a little bit more aggression to go for the kill. And these are part of the psychologies that you have to leverage if you feel like you're ahead right now and you want to finish strong uh, through this through this phase. If you are ahead and you want to win, what I'm going to call on you to do right now is take advantage of this opportunity to level up your branding. So think about what's been working for you over the past, you know, again, six months to one year. How have you been able to differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself over the past six months to a year? Uh, what new opportunities have been presented to you over the past six months to a year we, where we've had such an interesting transition? Opportunities are there for those who are scanning the environment uh, to see. And you really need to take advantage, again, of the fact that you are slightly ahead, double down, lean in and finish strong. The second psychology that is, you know, oftentimes the most frustrating uh, is when you're ahead at a certain point, but you lose. So looking at that same situation uh, of being ahead, what happens to people or what happens to people in their business or in their personal lives that results in conceding the lead? A lot of times it comes from not being able to critically self-reflect and evaluate and understand that while you're ahead, it's actually a tight lead. It's not you know, as great of a margin as you might've originally conceived. So when you ask yourself these questions about where am I in my life and in my business, where you may find that you have uh, you know, some advantages in business, maybe there are some areas in your personal life, your self-care, things that you really need to attend to. Um, and that would be you know, having that cautious optimism to lean in and go forward. What does it look like in life being ahead and losing? If we think back to a few years ago, it was fascinating to watch what happened uh, uh, in the uh, Clinton and Trump uh, election. And you know, regardless of your politics, I think there's a really important lesson to learn. And I love these quotes that came out of the Washington Post. If we look at what happened with Hillary Clinton's campaign, just days before the election, after weeks of believing that Michigan was safely blue, the pro-Hillary Clinton Super PAC priorities, USA polled voters there only to discover that it was a one-point race. The group quickly poured millions into the state. The Clinton campaign did similarly. And on the eve of the election, aides sent in Clinton herself, as well as her top surrogate, President Obama. But it was too late. And again, you know, I've been trying to make the case here to you guys that life is full of tight scores. It is, regardless of the industry that you're in, regardless of the business that you're in, and also in our personal lives, there are tight scores all the time that are, you know, pivotal moments, moments of transition, moments of inflection in our life and in our business. And this is an example of, you know, one as it pertains to political campaign, um, not being critically self-aware, understanding where you really are situated, understanding that the margin of your lead is smaller than you think. So again, the caution there is to, if you are ahead, make sure that you are still willing to take risks, be cautiously optimistic, have that killer instinct, but also make sure that you're not too trusting or becoming complacent in a way that can create vulnerability for you at the last minute where there won't be enough time to recover. Think about it this way. In your business and in your life, the best defense is a strong offense. So always lean into your expertise with your foot on the gas pedal so you don't give up the lead that you have. All right, the third psychology of close games is being behind and losing. In some ways, a person might say that this is kind of an expected outcome, but it's not really an expected outcome because there's so much opportunity uh, still. If you remember what I'm saying, in tight games, it's not a situation where you were completely outmatched, but you actually had an opportunity. So what happened? Usually it's a psychology of self-pity, a lack of resilience, lack of support, lack of creativity, and not realizing how closely matched the teams or the situation really is. Sometimes uh, 
this this happens where you don't understand that your opponent still has an upper hand so you may you know find that you're fighting your way back but not be sensitive to the fact that hey you still have areas of vulnerability you still have deficits that you need to look into within your business what does this look like in real time in real life um, i am so moved by the story of jeremy richmond uh, and I just want to share with you guys for a couple minutes a little bit of a video just you know in, in a moment a, a video of him speaking and jeremy uh richmond had a child who uh was killed in a school shooting and you know he is just displayed such powerful uh, resilience and leadership and he turned that tragedy into an opportunity to educate people in mass and uh, to talk about uh, you know how we need to resolve these issues of gun violence in schools and what we can do and he did beautiful work uh, he and his wife so i just want to kind of cut to him so that you can see a little bit of the work that he has done I'm a neuroscientist and I'm gonna talk about the science of violence and compassion and hopefully by the end of my talk you'll understand why a geeky guy like me would be talking at a storytelling uh, artist summit. Um, but let me start at the beginning which is a little bit dark. I'm here because we have an epidemic of violence and we're all familiar, unfortunately all too familiar with this fact. Worldwide we know that half of the kids in the world are victimized violently every year. Every one of us is going to be touched by violence directly or indirectly uh, many times in our lives. Violence to self and violence to others. When it comes to the United States, none of us are surprised that we have big problems. Violent crimes occur many times a minute, homicide a couple an hour, rape every six and a half minutes, when it comes to violence to self, a suicide is completed every 14 minutes. And there's five people that die by drug overdose every hour. These are sobering statistics. And unfortunately, 1,616 days ago, I became one of these statistics. And that's why I come to you today. As a parent who, at that time, lost my only child, our beautiful girl, six years old, Aviel, when she was murdered in her first grade classroom with 19 of her friends and classmates and six of her educators uh, in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. As you can imagine, that turned your world upside down. Uh, it derailed everything uh, in our life, everything that we had all the hopes and aspirations to do. You literally lie on the floor feeling like the world is spinning out of control and if you don't hold on, you're just gonna get spun off. And in that depth of horrible heartbreak and despair, my wife and I said we have to do something. We have to change things. So you can see in that video uh, of Jeremy uh, Richmond, just, you know, the passion that he has brought to a very tragic situation. And it's amazing because there's so much inspiration to glean there from a person who's been able to take such a, a, a negative situation and turn it into a positive in, uh, inspirational and teaching opportunity. However, um, in March 2019, unfortunately, Jeremy Richmond took his own life. And when I learned of this uh, story and this situation, and I learned, you know, that he had not been able to fight all of the way through, it really kind of gave me pause. And I really t spent a lot of time in reflection about his situation and his circumstances. And I also recognized that this is a vulnerability that we have. Again, when we're in moments of tight scores, you have to be able to read the game well for yourself and where you cannot, you need the support and the, you know, the friendship and um, the insight of people who are going to be able to help read the game for you. So where it seemed that he had bounced back, where it seemed that he had recovered, he was not aware of the vulnerabilities that still existed in himself. And, um, you know, 
clearly other people in his life weren't able to recognize also the vulnerabilities that were still there. He had put on such a, you know, a brave face and was making such a positive impact um, that, you know, the world really still wasn't sensitive to uh, the vulnerabilities that he had. So this is really important about, you know, being behind and making sure that you don't let that uh, momentary, that moment of being behind slide into a complete loss. So what is it that we need to do when we are behind in our business? If you have answered those questions and you look at your business and you see that, hey, I'm not where I need to be, things are off track, you need to get back to the fundamentals. And you need to take the small and consistent steps that you need to turn things around. So, you know, I love this quote, if every act is efficient and no acts are inefficient, then you can't help but to become a success. So what that means is you need to break down where you are and go back to you know, the basic fundamental rudimentary steps of your business building and do each one of those in an efficient way and really cut out anything that is inefficient for the time until you can begin to gain the momentum for yourself to turn your business back and get yourself back on course towards a positive trajectory. You need to seek out accountability partners and think outside of the box, but not just throw caution to the wind. What's amazing about the side community is there's so much support that's offered. I know that coaching is available uh, to you guys. So this, this is the kind of accountability and support that you'd be looking to get. So that way uh, you can feel reinforced psychologically, uh, you can feel supported, but that you also have someone who's scanning in your business to see where vulnerabilities may still lie. Even if it seems like you might, you know, uh, have a little bit of a, a, a tick of momentum, you want sustainable progress. And that's going to take more than one mind working on the problems that you're dealing with and unpacking those problems to make sure that you are scanning and leaving no uh, hidden vulnerabilities. And the final psychology, uh, you know, is the idea of being behind and winning. And what does it take to come from behind and win the game? It takes vision, it takes faith, which I also would describe as grateful expectation. It takes uh, you know, diligent work ethic, critical self-evaluation, and the ability to make mid-course corrections. So you, know, you wanna be decisive and make decisions firmly, but you also want to be constantly, again, scanning and seeing what do I need to do better? Where am I still having vulnerabilities? Where are there still a threat? Or where are there additional opportunities that I might need to lean into? So that mindset of constantly uh, evaluating and making those corrections. And then finally, the ability to build up the fight. Best example of myself, uh, best example of being behind and winning in life is my own life story. Uh, so, you know, looking at a person like myself, an African-American woman, child of an immigrant, I, you know, in many ways would say that I kind of was born into a situation where I, I was I was behind socially. If you look at racial barriers, just as an example, only 38% of black students finish college in the United States. Uh, again, like I mentioned, I'm a first generation African-American. Um, in 1981, the year that I was born in, in Ghana, 58 out of every 1,000 uh, babies, infants that were born didn't make it past the age of five. So, you know, it's just by, you know, good fortune that I happen to be born on this side of the pond rather than the other, where so many of my uh, cousins and other relatives were born because um, I just, just narrowly evaded those additional risks. When, it look, when we look at gender barriers, um, Black women represent only 2% of the science and engineering profession. Uh, and I have already mentioned to you guys kind of the experience in the career that I've had in sciences. So many, many different kinds of barriers to overcome there. And then those just compounded by other kinds of life experiences, serious illnesses and injuries that I've had, uh, assaults that I've survived, miscarriages, just so many different kinds of Tragedies, you know, you know, one way or another that have uh, compounded the relative disadvantage that I've experienced in some ways. But what does it take to come from behind and really win? And at this point in my life, I would describe it as, you know, certainly uh, a, a victory, victorious outcome, 
Um, my husband and I both are running successful businesses. We have a family that we are growing and we're able to make a positive impact in the world. And those are the standards by which I measure winning. As I mentioned, you're gonna to have to use faith, creativity, and excellence to turn a game around. So whether it's kind of, you know, on a broader kind of time scale over a life course that you're considering whether or not you're behind and how you're trying to find a way to win, or whether it's in a shorter interim time scale, it might be like in a specific instance or season in your business or moment in your life, um, it's going to take self-belief. So I encourage you to be mindful of what you consume. During the time window that you're going through this, a process of, you know, trying to transition yourself from behind to pushing yourself to a position of being ahead or in the lead, you need to be very, very mindful of the kinds of content that you consume. But this is something that you need to look at in general over your entire life course, because everything that you feed into yourself, into your mind, creates um auto suggestion. So it creates in your subconscious an idea of who you are and what you can do. And those are the seeds that you plant that actually sprout into faith or fear later on in your life. So, you know, you need to begin and develop the practice of making sure that you are consuming things that are uh, positive, that are restorative, that are inspiring, that motivate you. And you really need to eliminate things that detract from your self-confidence or from your focus or from the vision that you have for yourself, for your business or for your future. Uh, because uh, again, when you squeeze a sponge, whatever's in it is what's going to come out. You can't tell often if the sponge is wet or dry until you squeeze it. So you want to make sure that you are feeding yourself. So in those moments where you are squeezed, where the pressure is on, where it's tense, uh, you know, out of that will pour what you have been feeding yourself and feeding your soul. And that's where you're going to find that deep motivation. You're going to need excellent foundational skills. Another way of describing this is just your professionalism. You want to make sure that you have, you know, a proficient mastery of the foundational skills of your business, because that's what you're going to have to go back to and lean on and rely on at this moment to gradually, consistently, persistently move yourself from that, uh, you know, negative space to that positive space. Uh, you need the consistency on those small things to create the momentum, to shift the momentum, to shift the field in your favor. You're also going to need to have the courage to take big risks in the right moment. And you're going to have to be extremely adaptable. And those are the skills that you're going to need in a moment, in a season, or over a lifetime, depending on how you're considering this, this particular uh, suggestion. So again, going back to where you are in your life and in your business, either you're ahead and what you need to do is really focus on the ways that you can strategically leverage the advantage that you have while being cautious and sensitive and still getting support uh, from the community around you to continue to scan to see where there may be vulnerabilities that you aren't sensitive to. If you're behind, what you need to do is get back to those fundamental rudimentary steps uh, of your business, focus on your professionalism. You're going to have to mind what you consume so that you can focus on faith, creativity, and excellence. Again, leveraging the support that you have from the community at side, from the community that you have through your other professional and personal networks so that you can pull yourself uh, gradually towards the outcomes that you want. And the final note and most important note on how to play when the score is tight, you got to keep playing the game. You got to play to the whistle. So you need to know the difference between being ahead and winning because that's where so many people falter. And you need to know the difference between being behind and losing because that's where a lot of people falter as well. Uh, and I love this Jordan quote that I just want to end on, another great athlete to uh, derive wisdom and encouragement from. He says, I never lost a game. I just ran out of time. So, so long as you still have time on the clock, you still have an opportunity uh, to leverage the advantages that you have, the knowledge and professionalism that you have, and the community that's available to you to uh, win the game and have the best outcome that you want. Thanks so much, you guys, for listening. I hope this was helpful. Definitely let me know uh, how, this hit, how this hit you, how this impacted you. I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you, Mimi.